not us. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is our spring quarter DRMA lecture, DeAndreas Rosati Memorial Archives lecture. I'm Scott Kelly, I work in the Office of Mission and Values. So as you can see, some shameless promotion. We have lots of stuff going on this spring quarter. Um, but today is a, a special honor to um, have uh, Matthew Brajan with us, who's a visiting international Vincentian scholar. Um, so he's with us this quarter, um, continuing his incredible work um, in a variety of different areas in Vincentian heritage. So thank you for coming. Uh, in terms of schedule, <coughs> We thought uh, you're welcome to still grab some food and some sustenance to keep body, mind, and soul together. Um, Matthew will talk for um, a half hour, 45 minutes. We'll have time for questions and answers after that. Um, at 12.30, uh, I realize some of you may have other commitments, so um, you're free to leave at that point, while you're free to leave at any point. <laughs> uh, the, the doors will be unlocked starting at 12.30. Uh, but we have the space until 1, so if you're able to stay around until 1, I encourage you. Uh, there's just a, a great opportunity um, to, uh, to interact with Dr. Brejean. So I'd like to introduce uh, Sister Betty Ann McNeil, who's our Incension Scholar in Residence, to um, introduce Dr. Brejean. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You're in for a real treat this afternoon. Dr. <coughs> Matthew Brichon de Lavigny is a visiting international Vincentian scholar here at DePaul for the quarter. In his real life, he is associate professor in contemporary history at the Catholic University of the West, which is located in Angers, France, but he is on the Van campus and is also chair of the Department of History there. He's a researcher in 19th, at the Center for 19th Century History at the Sorbonne University <coughs> of Paris. He's noted for a, a few publications, mm. La Société de Saint-Vincent de Paul, au XIXe siècle, en Florent du Catholicisme Social, on the Saint, Society of Saint Vincent de Paul, Histoire de Fiat la Charité, la Rue pour Cloître, The History of the Daughters of Charity, which is wonderful reading, and it is not bedtime reading because it will not put you to sleep. <laughs> Presumably, you're fluent en français because it is in French and Spanish at the moment. Matthew and Monsieur Tort collaborated in publishing L'Union du Trône et de l'Hôtel, Politique et Religion sur la Restauration. Dr. Brigitte de Levigny lives with his lovely wife, Jean Alice, and their darling four children in Van, France. The background on the History of the Daughters of Charity project is that Sister Eveline Frank, the Superior General, con commissioned him to write a two-volume history of the company. He's working on volume two at the present, and the chapters are just rolling off the press. The author conducted thorough research in the order to do this history in national, departmental, and community archives to find and analyze significant documents from 1617 to the eve of the French Revolution. Most Audits of Charity and most Vincentians are unfamiliar with some of the insights that Dr. Brejean de Lavigny will share with us. The Institute of France bestowed the distinguished Gobert's Prize on this book for excellence. And this is the same prize that Frederick Osanon <coughs> received for his two-volume opus, Germanic Studies, in 1849. Dr. Brichon de Lavigny's Histoire de la Fille de la Charité has been acclaimed by the highly esteemed British historian, Dr. Colin Jones of the University of London, who wrote, and I quote, by this fine study, Brejean de Lavigny puts all historians of religion in his debt and also provides the raw materials that will now need to be digested by historians of women, work, medicine, and the relief of the poor. 
Matthew will now give an overview of this work in a presentation entitled The Street as a Cloister, Writing a Global History of the Daughters of Charity. I present to you Dr. Brejean de Lavigny. Matthew? So thank you very much for the welcome. I would like to thank uh, DePaul University, the Office of Mission and Values, and all of them for this very enjoyable stay for me um, in Chicago. Uh, so the street as a cloister, writing a global history of the Daughters of Charity. This is a history of the main congregation of women uh, in the Catholic world. They are today about uh, 20,000 sisters spread uh, in about 100 countries. But there were 45,000 um, at the end of the Second uh, Vatican II uh, Council. So the history of this uh, fall must be done one, one day. But today I will just present you the first part of this story from the beginning during the 17th century to the suppression of the congregation um, under the French Revolution in 1793. This is mainly uh, a French history. At this time, during the 17th and 18th century, we had about 8,000 sisters spread in 500 houses, but mainly in France. There were also some in Poland and in Belgium. Uh, it gave this uh, huge book, you see, maybe a bit too big to be read, but uh, anyway. Uh, the challenge was to write uh, a total or a complete history. This refers to a challenge typical of the French school of history and to its master, Ernest Labrousse, who was a professor at the Sorbonne after the war. And in his Marxist perspective, all was linked in the society from the uh, foreground, the economical aspects, to the top of the society, the cultural and religious aspects. Even if I'm not a Marxist and as many scholars today, uh, we are influenced by this uh, way of embrace, history, of embrace history and what we like to do in France is to choose a topic and uh, study it by all its sides. Um, so my aim was to study the history of the daughters but to uh, to go out of an internal approach and put this history in a larger context, a social, political, and cultural uh, one. So today, I will just focus on the question of the origins of the Daughters of Charity. I argue that the representations of the origins of the company, of the Daughters of Charity, are deeply based on memory. A memory which changed a lot through the centuries. One can conclude that the history of a religious community, and maybe even any human organization, must be conducted beyond their origins. In that way, I will present uh, today the, inter the interest of studying also the 18th century. Bali associated to Vincentian history, which seems more at its place uh, during the 17th century and also the 19th century, which was a great time of expansion for the daughters of charity. Okay, don't I speak too fast? Is that okay? Okay, thank you. So let's go to the first point. Uh, the daughters of charity and their own uh, history. Sometimes I'm asked why I'm interested in this Vincentian history. I prefer to answer in another way why the Daughters of Charity are today interested in their own history. I think that one of the main reasons is the evolution of the recruitment today of the company. Eight out of ten Daughters of Charity were European in the mid-20th century. And to be different, the Daughters' history in the United States is not far from this European history thanks to the personality of Elizabeth Seaton, the union with France in 1850, and also the importance of European immigration in the United States. But today, no more than six out of 10 daughters are still European. So therefore, the transmission of this heritage, spiritual and historical heritage, to a community that is becoming more and more international is a real challenge for the sisters today. 
And starting this uh, research, I was very impressed to see how the Doubters of Charity's spirituality has always been deeply nourished by history. When Louise de Marillac died, the Doubters gathered her letters. The conferences of Vincent were copied. And this is very interesting to observe which texts, which texts were copied to which doubters. They, for, a very, for a very long time, the sisters didn't have a total a full access to all the letters of Vincent and Louise, as we have today thanks to the works and the books of Pierre Coste and Elizabeth Sharpie. Some of them were copied in manuscripts when the, sister was, when the sisters were sent to establishment. I will just give you an example. With this book of conferences copied for Marianne Bonjoie in 1724. This is a book of about 600 pages, and as you can see, there are some conferences of the superiors, Monsieur Vincent here, six, but also conferences of the directors and Monsieur Ena here at the beginning of the 18th century, 11. So they had to read more conferences by Monsieur Ena than Monsieur Vincent, for example. <laughs> and there is also half of the book is made by the life of Maturin Guerin. Maturin Guerin was the superior, the general uh, mother of the daughters, and she died in 1704. And Monsieur Ena also gave a conference about the primitive spirit in 1701. At that time, and with the death of Maturin Guerin, nobody had known the founders and the founding time. So there was a, a urge in the company to come back to this primitive spirit. And one, one can uh, see that in uh, that sort of uh, book. So in the conference of Monsieur Enin, he said that the primitive spirit um, can be understood in two ways. The first one is the particular spirit of the company, different from other congregations. The other understanding is a historical understanding. This was the spirit of the beginning, the spirit of Vincent, Louise, and the first uh, sisters. And compared to these primitive spirits, superiors at that time complained that the spirit of poverty was fading. For example, sisters were not eating with forks. Uh, well, no, were not eating with their fingers, but with forks. Uh. So what did Monsieur Vincent say? Uh, so we have no forks today, so. <laughs> and in fact, this is very difficult to understand this sort of text because the context uh, was different. And during the 18th century, France was becoming richer. So for example, uh, wearing shoes instead of sabots, wooden shoes, was considered rich during the 17th century. But in the 18th century, everybody, even the poor, uh, wear uh, shoes. So one has to be very careful with what can be called, what can be called the myth of the origins. Of course, the Second Vatican Council asked communities to come back to their uh, founder's charism. Evangelica Testificatio, it was in 1971. It is also true that the spirit of the founders could carry a new dynamism. But the context was so different. So history can be useful, I think, to help to discern the context of the previous time and the needs of the present uh, time. So who founded the Daughters of Charity? When I ask the question to the sisters, they often answer Vincent first, Louise, and sometimes Marguerite Nezo, the third one. And of course, three of them, this was a collective foundation. But what I'm arguing here is that this representation of a collective foundation is a product of memory in the company. And this argument is based on a book by a famous historian and Jesuit, Michel de Sarto. Some of his books have been translated in English, but not this one, La Faiblesse de Croire. He wrote, we reorganize the past in terms of the sense we want to give to the present. We reorganize the past in terms of the sense we want to give to the present. So let's start with the closer figure, Marguerite uh, Nezo. St. Vincent gave a conference about Marguerite in 1642. 
And he said that she was the first daughter of charity, even if she died before the foundation of the company in 1633. But this was already a reinterpretation of the beginning of the company. Because a few years later, uh, before, Vincent wrote to Louise when a sister died, she is the first victim among your sisters of charity. So we have to understand why Vincent gave this conference in 1642. In fact, there was some trouble between him and Louise around um, this time. But the fall of the floor at the new mother house of the daughter of charity, which uh, almost killed Louise and her sisters, was seen by Vincent and Louise as a sign of the providence, of the providence that God had generated himself this new community. So they need to read again the origins. Then he came back and, find, and found that Margaret was one of the first uh, sisters. She played a key uh, role. Unfortunately, the memory of Margaret, I have no picture of Margaret, of course, but uh, the memory of Margaret had completely, di completely disappeared in the company in favor of a collective figure, the primitive sisters, the first sisters. And it's, it was only after Perfecti Caritatis in 1965 that Margaret appeared again, thanks to the will of the mother general, sister Lucy Roger, um, who said in a conference that Margaret gave the original character of the company that Vincent and Louise just transmitted. Um, so how can we understand her daring, and it was of course uh, it, her daring, which put Vincent and Louise in a second position. And in that way, Michel Dossierto can be uh, useful. I think there were two senses Sister Lucy Roger wanted to give to the present of the daughters at this time, so after the uh, council. The first one was an imperative of poverty. This was the time of a third world thought, pulsated in the church by the encyclical Populorum Progressio in 1967. One prefers to refer to a founder close to the good girls of the countryside, like Vincent uh, liked them more than Louis de Marillac, who was just present in, in two major books uh, during the 50s, Monsignor Calvé and a sister, a Dominican one, Sister Poinsonnet, who tried a, a psychoanalytic approach, and they presented a neurotic and aristocratic woman. So that was not the best figure to present in that time. And in fact, Marguerite was a poor girl from the countryside of Paris. That was also another sense uh, Sister Lucy Roger wanted to give to her present. It was an imperative of democracy. Democracy. I'm sorry for the accent <laughs> of democracy. Uh, Ecclesia Sancte, uh, 1966, asked the religious congregations to transfer the authority from the general superiors and their council to the general assembly, which represented all the community and had a deliberative power. So at that time, the first sisters and Margaret appeared as the historical cushion for the introduction of democracy in the congregation, in the community. And this is very clear if you look, if you look at the archives in, uh, of the preparation of the General Assembly in 1968. So my opinion is that Margaret was seen as a founder thanks to post-Vatican II's needs for aggiornamento and to the context of a progressive church during the 70s of the 20th century. So this is a representation of some uh, first sisters. So, you know, if we put Margaret uh, into the light, St. Louise suffered in comparison during the 20th century. And poor Louise, because her memory cycle uh, as a founder was not so long in the modern company. It just started at the beginning uh, of the 1880s. I walked in the archives in Paris through a very fascinating survey initiated by the superior, Monsieur Fiat, and more than a thousand answers from the sisters are kept in the archives. And most of them said that they prayed to Louise in private or in their community houses. And they didn't understand why 
we didn't talk more about Louise in the company. So the question here is to understand why Louise uh, was seen again as a founder at that time. I think this is also linked to the context. The context was I have here an engraving of Louise. Uh, the 19th century has been presented by scholars as a century of feminization of Catholicism. There is a famous uh, book by Claude Langlois. So there was a feminization of consecrated life, more and more sisters and nuns, feminization of practice of devotion also, women participate in the liturgy and sacraments more than men, feminization of the spirituality also, and there were four apparitions of the um, uh, Virgin Mary in France at that time, include the Rue du Bac. So a century of feminization. So maybe a need to have uh, a feminine founder uh, more than a masculine one. Another aspect of the context is the political one. That time was... Um, there was some laicization of hospitals and parish works at that time, since the Republicans, who were anti-clerical, won the election instead of the monarchists. So many daughters were asked to leave their houses and their hospitals. <coughs> so in this struggle, they prayed Louise to make a miracle, or at least to help them to support uh, this time. So I think that could explain why Louise uh, appeared again in the memory of the company. Now, if we go a bit further, uh, in the 18th century, we find uh, Vincent as a founder. And I would like to show you this painting, um, which is a painting around the beatification, 1729, and the canonization, uh, 1737, of uh, St. Vincent. What you can see here, is Vincent here in the sky and stay uh, on the ground his three families the poor here the Vincentian here and the daughters of charity here with Louise de Mariac with her black uh, widow's cap and I think this is a time of a difference between the two founders uh, Louise stood on the floor and Vincent uh, <laughs> rose in the sky. <laughs> and if you look also to the text, the conferences, the circulars, more and more people talk about not the daughters of charity, but the sisters of Saint Vincent de Paul, the real sisters of Saint Vincent. And during the 19th century, this was the common expression in Europe, the daughters of Saint Vincent de Paul. So this is, of course, a consequence of the cult of St. Vincent, who was very famous even outside the church. But this is also a very clerical and masculine way to embrace the foundation. So to conclude in one word, you have three times and three models of a foundation in the um, company. A clerical one, a gendered one, and a democratic uh, one. Now, okay, I have some time. <laughs> Now, if you try to think of what happened, uh, I think we need to build a, a new model of foundation. And this is what I, I'm going to, to try to expand, a progressive collective model of foundation. Often, we need to identify one founder and one date of foundation. One founder and one date. For example, if we look at the history of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, the founder is Frederick Ozanam, and there is one date, April 23, during the year 1833. But Ozanam was not alone. He had some friends, uh, some students with him, and also another man, Emmanuel Bailly, who uh, was a member of charities before Ozanam and brought his experience to this group of students. And the first rules of the St. Vincent de Paul Society were not written before two years of experience. And during these two years, about 200 students joined the first group in Paris, in the Latin Quarter. And all of them debated and voted. So we can maybe say that 
the founders of the St. Vincent de Paul Society are Ozana, of course, Emmanuel Bay, but also maybe these 200 students during these two years. So this is a more progressive and collective, collective model of foundations. And I think that Vincentian Foundation uh, present this model. And this is maybe the model of foundation of uh, communities who want to live in the world and not try to escape um, to it. And so uh, I saw that in the foundation of the Daughters of Charity and I tried to explain it in the book. And actually I think that the foundation of the Daughters of Charity is a really unlikely process which associated three different projects. The first one is the project of Vincent de Paul, the Congregation of the Mission, and all the confraternities of charities they found uh, after their missions since the first one in Châtillon in 1617. The other uh, project is the one of Louise de Mariac, of course, and her desire of perfection through a religious life. But in 1623, in a Parisian parish, Saint Nicolas des Champs, where she had a mystical experience, um, her projects changed a little. And then the third project is the one of Marguerite Nezo, and the common life started by young women like her from the poor classes who are following the impulse of evangelization of the Council of Trent. This led to the foundation of the Daughters of Charity in 1633, but this date, this point, was just, I think, the the outcome of a long work in process. I'd like in that way to insist on um, the difference between Châtillon's foundations and the Daughters of Charity's foundation. Sister Betian will read this little text to change the voice. <laughs> Can we not unite these good ladies and exhort them to give themselves to God to serve the poor? So this was the beginning of the, confr the confraternity of charity in Châtillon. There was nothing original here in this foundation. Confraternities or lay groups were very common. They came from the Middle Ages, but they knew a new growth uh, thanks to the Catholic Reformation after the Council of Trent. Vincent de Paul wrote himself that he took the idea in Roma, but also in Paris. Now the Diocese of Lyons, where was Châtillon, was one of the entries of the Roman influences in France. We know the names of the first ladies who joined uh, the group in Châtillon. They were ladies from the local lower nobility and also the bourgeoisie. Actually, Châtillon was a market, a place for wheat, fish and wine. So people who were not in need, these ladies, came to the assistance to people who were poor. This was happened in Châtillon, but also in all the confraternities uh, of charity after that. And Louise de Mariac and her friends uh, all belonged also to the nobility or the bourgeoisie close to it in Paris. They were all married women or widows and spent their time and money also in a devout and charitable lives. The famous Francis de Sales book, Introductions, Introduction to the Devout Life, which was a bestseller at, the, at that time, was one of their favorite books. If you look now to the first young woman like Margaret Nezo, one can see on the contrary that they were coming from poor classes. Numerous of them started a common life, regular prayers, but they didn't make vows so that they weren't assimilated to nuns and to a cloistered life. There was actually a word in Latin. L Latin? Latin? Mm -hmm. Out maritus, out morus. This is the destiny for a wife, for a, a woman. Sorry. Out maritus, out morus, either married or cloistered. So this young vagabond woman, uh, Margaret and her friends, were barely thought of. People made fun about them because of their poverty. Because, and they were taken sometimes for prostitutes, which were numerous at this time, uh, and who followed soldiers in groups. Their vocation was built in adversity. 
That's why Marguerite accepted the proposition of Vincent in a mission to join the Confraternity in Paris. This corresponded to her vocation, but also gave her stability since she had no resources. Anyway, what happened in Châtillon uh, is a vocation where poor people served other people who were poor. This leads to the question uh, about the cloister, out meritus, out uh, cloisters. There is a famous conference uh, given by Vincent, and you will understand the title of this later, the title. Sister Bettian, please. <coughs> Since they, the Dogmas of Charity, are more exposed to the occasion of sin than nuns bound to the cloister, having for monastery only the houses of the sick and the place where the superioress resides, for cell a hard room, for chapel the parish church, for cloister the streets of the city, for enclosure obedience, for grill the fear of God, for veil holy modesty. So for cloister the streets of the city. How can we understand that Vincent de Paul managed to build a new women community without a cloister? While Francis de Sales had to accept the will of Monseigneur de Marquemont to enclose the visitations in 1617. First, Vincent de Paul was a very good canonical lawyer. He chose a very modest common frame, the confraternity of charity. He didn't say, here, look at my new community. Not at all. On the contrary, he said that nothing had happened. The daughters were members of the confraternities of charity like the ladies. All remained lay people. But in fact, Vincent and Louise impulsed a real religious life in this frame as demanding as a real congregation. The second point is uh, Vincent de Paul had also a very good political protections, protection thanks to the bishops of Paris, the Gondi. He was a member of that patronage. The first approbation by Gondi came in 1646. The royal approbation came three years later. Is he also thanks to the role of Vincent at the Conseil de Conscience? And the regent knew very well the daughters she asked for Fontainebleau, for example. The Prince of Condé, chair of the council during the minority of Louis XIV, had a wife, Charles de Montmorency, who was a lady of charity in Paris and had founded two daughters in Chantilly. But what was more difficult was to get the approbation of the Parliament of Paris. Because the, magist the magistrates clearly understood that the confraternity was in fact uh, a way to hide something impossible, a religious feminine life without a cloister. But there was a previous case uh, with the Daughters of the Cross. One another ma major reason to get the probation of, the, of this new community um, is linked to the social origins of the first daughters. Vincent often emphasized the fact that they were poor girls from the countryside. And this was not only a spiritual way of life. When young women became nuns, nuns and nun sisters at that time, their perpetual vows meant that they were dead in regard to the civil law. So they renounced it to their family, uh, to their heritage because of the dowry given to the convent. But with simple vows, Women can escape from their community life. So what will happen to the dowry? Will the family keep it again? Will they have to pay again for a dowry for a wedding? So they were very anxious. So if you say that you only have poor girls in this new community, there is no danger for the society uh, thanks uh, to this uh, dowry. And in fact, if you look at the history of the daughters during the 17th and 18th century, there were many oppositions from rich families or middle class families to a vocation of their daughter in this community uh, because of this, case, this question of dowry. 
A last reason of success, uh, less known, is a chron chronological one. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, before the foundation in 1633, there were many groups in Europe since the end of the 16th century who began such a life, a such life. It was the case of the Ursuline of Angel Morrissey in Italy, the Jesuitesses of Mary Ward in England, the Daughters of Notre Dame, founded in Lorraine by Alex Leclerc, the Daughter of the Cross in Picardy, and many and many others. And many of these groups, uh, smaller, remained unknown. And the group of Marguerite and her friends was, was one of this one. And when these groups uh, grew up, they had to accept to be cloistered. So the foundation of the Daughters of Charity came in a second time. So Vincent uh, uh, took advantage of this experience to know what to do. But what must also be underlined in this story, according to recent studies about the cloister, is that there was not only an external pressure on the congregation. Many of these sisters and many of these congregations, even teaching and nursing congregations, wanted to be cloistered. Because after the Council of Trent, the cloister was presented as a way of perfection. And Louise de Mariac herself had known this feeling. As a young girl, before her wedding, she admired the reformed nuns, or the new ones established in Paris, like the very author Capucin or Carmelites, where she had some relatives and where she wanted to enter. And if you look at the letters of Vincent and Louise, many first sisters had also the same desire, become a real congregation with vows. And some of them left the company to join a real congregation and became nuns. This was also, I think, why Vincent told them that, the, that their life was as demanding as a religious one and even more what you can see in this uh, conference. Uh, to conclude this point, uh, one can say that the Tridentine context had made possible the foundation of the Daughters of Charity, but it had also raised huge tensions outside and inside the new community. This was, this was the beginning of what scholars, Gabriel Zari, Camilla Russell, had called the third status. The third status, which is a third way between a religious and a secular life. This foundation was uh, also deeply emerged in the 17th century context. I don't know. So we stop at in five minutes. Okay. I will go directly to the sixth point. <laughs> um, anyway, I'd like to, to show how the foundation was not finished in the 17th century, but we can also say that it was a perpetual work in, in progress. Uh, and you know, each new establishment uh, built by the daughters was called a foundation. And every people who pay for the daughters to come in a hospital or in a parish was called a founder. So one can say that the foundation continued all along the 18th century. And I would like to, to finish with some uh, uh, pictures. Uh, maybe we can put some less light if you want. Uh, this is a painting um, of uh, Madame Necker. You can see her. Madame Necker was the spouse of Louis XVI's Minister of Finance. She was a Protestant lady and typical of the uh, philanthropic movement uh, among the elites in the 18th century. And she found a new hospital in Paris and a very modern one you can see here the large windows with a lot of light. You can see only there is just one sick per bed and not two or three. And she asked the most famous nurses and sisters to uh, run this hospital, the Daughters of Charity. Another example uh, with a famous painter, Greuze. Uh, this uh, painting is in Lyons. 
la dame de charité, the lady of charity. You can see here the lady of charity with her daughter. So it was a way to teach her daughter how to visit the poor and the sick uh, who are here. And in a very modest position behind, you can see the lady of charity. And in fact, they came from two different worlds uh, uh, in this time. And I think that's why the company continued to grow up. And I'm, I don't have many statistics to, to show and to present here, but just one or two. Uh, you have here the, all the hospitals and parish works funded in France during the old regime, so from the beginning to the French Revolution. If you look at the number, so more than 500 just in France, and 45 persons were funded during the 18th century. So what cannot say that the 18th century was a century where nothing happened, especially in religious aspects. Another one is uh, about the admissions to the seminary of Paris during the eight, 17th and 18th century. You know, the trend is uh, in that sense. And just before the French Revolution, in, uh, during the 18th, um, you have about 600 sisters during five years. So that means 100 each year. So that was a very strong uh, community just before the revolution. Also a very young one, one of the younger, youngest among the communities. And that could explain also why they came back so quickly after their suppression, when Napoleon, the emperor, asked them to come back to run the, uh, the Hotel des Invalides, who was for uh, soldiers, because he needed to have some cheap and good uh, nurses for this hospital. Um, so let's come back in the 17th century. <laughs> And uh, I would like to, uh, to, to show how this foundation was deeply merged in the 17th century uh, context. Um, you have here a very uh, famous uh, painting in the Vincentian family, so um, kept in the public assistance uh, museum in Paris. Uh, this shows the confraternity of charity of the Hostel Dieu uh, in Paris. The Hostel Dieu was a famous hospital in Paris, and the, this confraternity was built in 1634, so just one year after the foundation of the Daughters of Charity, thanks to a wealthy widow of the president of the Court of, Auditor, of Auditors, uh, Madame Gousseau. And uh, you can see some ladies here, and also here with Wisdom Mariac and Vincent here. Uh, most of these ladies came from the nobility. Uh, close to the court of the king, and most of them also came from the parliament. Uh, they were uh, married with member of the parliament of uh, Paris, and they gave here, you know, their jewel and their money to raise uh, the orphans of the hostel Dieu. And in this very hierarch hierarchical society, uh, there were not so many links between the top of the society, and also the poor. And you see here the that of the charity is also in a very modest and humble position because she belongs to a world closer, closer to the orphans than to this society. And Vincent and Louis here play the role as intermediaries between these two, uh, these two worlds. And in fact, sometimes we want to present Vincent as a very modern uh, man, but he was a man of the 17th century, and he deeply respected this social order. He thought that this order was wanted by God for the balance of the society. And he was not at all a, re a revolutionary man. <laughs> and he often said to the daughters of charity to respect the ladies even if they thought that they could do a better job you know, with the, uh, the sick people or the, um, these babies, because they can take care of the poor thanks to their money. So they had to respect it. And at the same way, Vincent de Paul was comfortable enough to use the social order and to put it um, for his own projects. The, this confraternity of the Hostel Dieu 
quickly became the place to be seen for all these ladies in Paris. <laughs> but uh, Vincent did not criticize uh, this very human sentiment, uh, but he put it, uh, you know, he used, he used it uh, to sell the poor. And uh, um, I walked um, through the contracts of foundation of all these hospitals and parish works I showed you in the uh, last statistics. So these are the personal, personal foundation, not the collective one. If a bishop or if a town asks for daughters of charity with the money of the groups, this is a collective foundation. But uh, some persons uh, personally can ask also the daughters to come in their uh, parishes or in their, um, around their castle on their estates. So most of them were made by the nobility. And another uh, explanation, most of them were made by women also. And half of these women were widows. So one can say that the common founder was a woman, often widow, from the nobility. And it could not have been possible in another way. So charity tried to change and to take care of the poor, but without making, a, at that time, a revolution. But by the protection of the grounds uh, of the kingdom, Vincent, in a way, uh, drove the company into a political dependence. I can give you just one example. When the Cardinal de Richelieu wanted, in 1638, some daughters for his new town he was building, uh, and the name of the town was Richelieu, as his own name, um, he cannot be disappointed. So Vincent asked the best daughters of charity to join uh, Richelieu for the cardinal, even if Louise didn't have uh, enough daughters for other places. There is, uh, there is uh, there another example. When the Grand Mademoiselle, a Grand Mademoiselle was the first cousin of Louis XIV, the king. She wanted to have some daughters in her own estates in Normandy, but she wanted also to have a seminary, a novitiate, in 1685. It was in Eu, and Eu is a little town among nowhere in the countryside. <laughs> So there was no reason, uh, no logical reason to have a seminary, a novice at her, and that was not far away from Paris. But the daughters had to accept it, of course. And this is the explanation why the daughters had two seminaries, the main one in Paris, but another one until the French Revolution in E. But the social demand during the old regime for teaching and nursing uh, sisters was so important in France that can explain how the company managed to survive to all the political changes uh, in France. I think now I will stop to let some time for questions, no? <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of uh, political dimensions, mm. um, and here I'm, I'm exhibiting the thinness of my knowledge. Um, I understand that uh, during the Thirty Years' War, especially in the battlegrounds of Lorraine, um, the king asked Vincent, I think, to send resources to take care of the civilian uh, wounded and maybe also the battlefield wounded. What exactly is the intersection between the state function and the sisters? Mm. So there were some sisters, but also some Vincentians, and maybe Father Yudovic could answer better than me on this question. but. All of them were um, asked to do something, also to raise money for these countries. And um, some sisters were sent uh, in, the in, the, in the east, but also in the north on other battle uh, fields. And there was also another function to the Vincentians uh, had some young women to escape these countries where they were raped by soldiers and they came in Paris. But there were um, many died, so uh, there is a letter when uh, uh, they said they, don't, um, they are not very uh, good sisters because they are too fragile to, uh, <laughs> to become. But they, were, uh, they, were, um, they, can, they could escape all these places. Mm. Yes. 
I, I noticed in many of the early pictures, Louise is always pictured, but then she disappears mm. in, in later pictures. I think. And, and also the, 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 for those paintings, the strict hierarchy about how people are posed, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, is, you know, perhaps there's that famous picture at St. Marguerite um, with, I think it's the Daughters of Wisdom, mm. uh, where Vincent de Paul, the, the boundaries hands Vincent the rule to hand up to Anna Lost. Mm. So all those paintings are very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Why does Louise disappear? Because she's a woman. Uh, well, of course. <laughs> Matthew, you mentioned very briefly about um, Vincent being a, a, an astute canon lawyer. Um, the, uh, I know that uh, apparently he was a fairly brilliant uh, young man because he at least he finished his studies in such a, 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 a fast state, but he also went back to school after he was ordained uh, for a while, and he taught. Um, but that's a part of him that's, that, the, that we don't know much mm -hmm. about or don't talk about. But anyway, um, sin, uh, is there anything you can enlighten us about in terms of what would have been um, his education? Where did he get this insight into canon law? Where did he get this ability? Um, which typically uh, the French clergy wouldn't necessarily have, mm. the diocesan clergy. This is a very good question, and I'm not sure to be able to answer. Uh, he made some studies in Toulouse, at the University of Toulouse, and I think he was not alone also, so he took some advices. And in fact, um, there were two, two groups of lawyers, of canonical lawyers at that time. Uh, the one who wanted to apply very strictly the Council of Trent, especially the question of the cloister. So Marc was one of these uh, lawyers. Uh, and some other who belonged, Vincent, who tried to uh, interpret the spirit of the Council. Uh, but they had to find some, some ways to, you know, to... Exactly. Mm. Thank you. So Council, who would have counseled them? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have the answer here. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of our Spanish confreres believe that he studied uh, for three years in Salamanca, uh -huh. and then he went to Toulouse, and they, they make a big point about the fact that he, he really got his education in Spain, mm -hmm. and he didn't go to France. So that's that's uh, maybe a little nationalistic approach by the uh, Spanish confreres. Who knows? <laughs> yes, another. Yes? Just a comment on uh, our own history of intentions. You find from the very beginning, 1625, uh, the congregation is bound, 1630s, 1640s, uh, Vincent has uh, someone in Rome working on the establishment of the congregation, recognition of Rome, and so forth. And, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the bottles and all those questions there. With the daughters, no contact with Rome. At least we were told that he. I think he just saw, I'm, found, I'm not founding a religious community, so why ask Rome about religious mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm founding that? But it certainly was um, a very judicial, judicious way of moving around mm -hmm. because he ne never never uh, asked them. And then by the time Rome recognized him, there's this thriving mm -hmm. group and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're approved. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the disappearance of Luis is it because of the illegitimacy mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now the question of her legitimacy is a very complex uh, question. Um, it was hidden also in the company for a very long time. And I mentioned the book of Monsignor Calvi, who was ready 10 years before he was published so, uh, because of this question. And um, in fact, a question uh, raised about her beatification. But when uh, the superiors of the mission asked Rome if it was a problem to, for her beatification, the answer was no, so that's not a problem. But if you want to join a community and you are illegitimate, you have to ask for permission of the bishop. So present, uh, you know, a founder as an illeg illegitimate girl, and at the same time you, you know, you can make some difficulties to accept uh, the sort of, so there was a... Um, Problem. Matthew, there's, yeah. a, there's a hospital and museum at, at the city of Bone in France, the one with the multicolored roof. Right. Mm. Anyway, they've got, it's, uh, there's a group of women who are 
mannequins now. They're, they're, they're part of the, part of the, uh, the displays. And I think they were the daughters of St. Martha. Yes, I don't remember the name of the congregation but who was in Bonn, but that was not, they were not the daughters of charity. They, uh, they had a, a habit that looked an awful lot like the daughters of charity mm. habit, mm. Uh, but they were uh, they any date the daughters by quite a bit. I mean, they, mm. I think the hospital been, was there in like the 15th century mm. and, and didn't close until sometime in the, the 1970s or 60s. Mm. There, it's a museum now. Mm. I think it's necessary to, you know, to put the doubt of charity in their context, and there were many, uh, more than a uh, hundred congregations with the same uh, aim during the old regime in France. So, but many were very uh, small, and just on the dependence of the bishop and one just diocese, some were a bit larger. And when you look at the geography, at, uh, I made some maps in my book, you can see that there were some concurrences, some, uh, you know, and sometimes some troubles between the congregations to you know, to go in a place and not in another one. So they, far, they, they mm. were cloistered, I believe, though, at, at that hospital. Mm. They were they were in a cloister, so they could work in the hospital. Yes, it was possible to be cloistered and run and a hospital. Yeah. It was possible also to teach and be cloistered. Yeah. So there was just um, an exemption with the Council of uh, Circo Pastoralis. So the nuns could not go away, yeah. but the students can come in. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Man, and you had um, a question. Regarding the point about um, pontifical approval. It seems to me that the papal legate approved the company in either 1668 or 88. I'm not quite sure, um, but I know that that is a fact. But the question I wanted to ask, since you spoke about the collective foundation of the society, you mentioned the students, the 200, the members, could you share if there were daughters of charity involved in the establishment of the society, or does Sister Rosalie Ron do? Um, what was her role? Excuse me, Sister Bettina, I saw someone going up and uh, I lost your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the collective foundation yes. of the society uh, uh, and uh, were there daughters involved? Oh, Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, did Sister Rosalie play into that foundation? Mm. Is she a co-founder, as some mm. propose? This is a huge debate. Uh, <laughs> I, well, there are some, where, where is it? Yeah, you know, this is a point uh, I didn't have the time to present today, but um, I presented it to the Doubters of Charity in the lectures I, I gave um, recently. And Rosalie Rowley is very famous in the United States. Uh, she is also in, in Paris. And many sisters uh, really think that she, she was a founder of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. I don't think so. <laughs> um, because this is also a problem of memory. You know, we live in the 21st century. So we look at the 19th century in Paris. And we look at these two huge figures, uh, Sister Rosalie, who is beatified, and Frederick Ozanam, who is beatified also. But at that time, Frederick Ozanam was just a student uh, among many students at the Sorbonne. Like if you take a student uh, here at DePaul. You know? And so he was a bit famous among his friends, but uh, maybe no more than uh, 50 uh, friends. Sister Rosalie was a bit more famous at that time because she lived for a long time in a very poor neighborhood near the Sorbonne, in the Quartier Mouffetard. But she didn't have so many links with the students. There were two very different lives. Today we, we know some sister, we, we see her, them uh, often, in, like in the university, but Sister Rosalie never... Um, Never went to the Sorbonne, of course. <laughs> so she had her own life, and the students had their own life. So there were some few contacts between them, but not as many to say that Sister Rosalie was a founder. She gave the first list of poor to visit in the neighborhood. She gave, uh, she gave also the first coupons of bread and wine and wood to give to the poor. Because the students, when they wanted to visit poor, so they didn't uh, know uh, any poor, so they had to ask someone. But there were some, you know, just few contacts. So we don't have proof or evidence of, of her mentoring in any way? Uh, we have some, uh, but very few. 
um, in the archives of the Saint Vincent de Paul Society in Paris, um, you have some bills mm -hmm. uh, at that time, and you can read five francs uh, to reimburse to Sister Rosalie. Ten francs at this day to reimburse to Sister Rosalie because she gave the first coupon. It was not her money, but the money of the town of Paris. So the the students had to reimburse her. So that means there were some links. But Frederick Ozanam, we we have a, a thousand and five hundred letters of Ozanam, and there is no word of Sister Rosalie. So I'm not sure that uh, Frederick Ozanam met Sister Rosalie. He must knew her, of course, but I'm not sure he met her very often. Maybe. But we don't know. But she had some uh, she had um, some links with other men and later of the society. One of them, very famous, is Armand de Menin in France. Armand de Menin was a, a young man from the nobility. When the king changed, he refused to sell the new regime, so he had nothing to do. And um, he um, heard about Sister Rosalie, so he came to visit her. And she said, he wrote a letter about that, she said, okay, go visit a poor and we will see if you come back. <laughs> and he came back and he worked with Sister Rosalie for a very long time. And when he was elected as a deputy at the National Assembly, he, um, he had to, to get the first law uh, on, um, uh, on the question of housing the poor. And he wrote the first biography about Sister Rosalie. So she had some links with these lay uh, and charitable people, but not so many with the first students. And you know, these students just stood three years in Paris. So they were changing a lot. Um, they were here for their graduate uh, uh, years, so three years for a license, sometimes four years for the PhD, so that was a very uh, uh, short. <laughs> and they left and came back to, to their town and families. But Sister Rosalie stood for uh, 40 years in this neighborhood. And you also had a question, I think. Yes, good. So <coughs> I'm struck by your quote from Michelle Vicento. So we reorganize the past. Mm. Mm. The present. I'm wondering, in, in your research, what sense you want to give to the present mm. with, with this collective foundation mm. that's multifaceted and mm. is a network more than mm. individual? Mm. Me? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because historians um, used to stay in a very modest position, like the Daughters of Charity, and try to explain this history. But I'm not a Daughter of Charity, so I give them this history, and I think they have to, to do something with it. Uh, well, I have some ideas, of course, uh, <laughs> on the question, mm, to share them. But, um, I'm not sure I can answer easily to your yeah. question, or maybe uh, in a very personal way. So around a, a good glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> One yes? of the things you shared, which I think is important, is that progressive notion of history and of how, mm -hmm. how things were formed. Mm. That, that seems to be something that you bring mm. strongly to this work. Mm. It can maybe help to, you know, not to sanctify too much the past, well, there is a past, and we have to do something with that and continue uh, the history, who, in a way, is uh, always different. Perhaps the, uh, the current uh, historical trend that your work manifests is your interest in women's history, mm. which was not there in previous centuries and or generations mm. to the extent that it is now. And so the question of the cloister and the street and mm. the... Uh, impact of the Council of Trent on women's <coughs> communities um, and it's a basic gender understanding of mm. the role of women in the church, that perhaps is mm. a current issue mm. that your work reflects. Mm. But that sort of thing is only obvious in retrospect. So 50 mm. years from now, mm. there will be a lecture uh, on this subject and you, your work will be mentioned and that historian will know where you fit in. Yes. Yes. Certainly, yes. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a Martin, another Marxist historian by the name of E.H. Carr who defined history as the continuous interaction of the historian and his facts. Mm. Uh, and you know, it, it, the historian continues mm. to interact mm. with his facts. Mm. That's, 
that's similar to what you said earlier about your your French historian who defined as a Marxist. Uh, it's the same kind of concept. The history changes because the historian develops different ideas about what the events were about because of what, he, what he's learned. Uh, yeah, one other thing, though, uh, Matthew, I know from Vincent's lecture of uh, 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 conferences, there's a, a number of times when he kept reminding the, the, the sisters to tell the bishop that you are not nuns, yeah. that you are women uh, serving the poor, yeah. dedicated to serving the poor. And he, he says that uh, on more than more than one occasion in his conferences to the sisters, reminding them to make sure you tell the bishop yeah. when they tell you we want you to be a nun. No, no, we're not nuns. We're, 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 we're women. Uh, it's poor women serving the poor. Yes, exactly. He, he was very... Uh, Adamant about that, and it was to keep them from under the. Well, I, I, I had that one. And I think. <laughs> keep them from uh, uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> and it, we have some examples where the sisters had many difficulties because they were less educated, of course, yeah. than the bishops and their priests. So when they arrived to try to explain something, what was you know a bit complicated in a yeah. juridical position. So and that could explain also why the rules were not printed. Uh, during Vincent's uh, lifetime, because he didn't want to that this rules were spread uh, around. In your, uh, with your talk of the 17th century context, you destroy two myths that we like to talk about at DePaul, which is Vincent as a revolutionary, <laughs> a social revolutionary, and the Vincentian sort of tradition and is very unique. Mm. Right? So mm. those are both obviously mm. not correct, but I'm wondering, mm. having said that, is there anything from your study of the daughters that you would say is in some way revolutionary or unique mm. about the Daughters of Charity? Mm. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a daughter of Charity also, I'd like to, you know, just comment that, first of all, I really appreciate um, your perspective because it just gives a different nuance to what I've, you know, been aware of of our history. But also, it, it, um, the thing that it confirmed in me was, you know, that God worked through Vincent and Louise and those early sisters, and they were creative. And I, mean, I think that's the, the heritage piece that we want to take. It's, it's, you know, we're in this part of our, our world. We are in this part of our history uh, in the world. And we have to discover today how, how Vincent and Louise would do what we're being called to do. And um, so, you know, it's that creativity, I think, and ingenuity to navigate through cat, you know, cat law of that day and to keep us out of the cloister and all that. So we've got to navigate in our church today in some ways. And so it's, it's just, you know, mm. what would Vincent have us do today? Matthew, one of the things I really appreciate is the depth of research that you have done in the original records to compile a scientific history rather than what we have had as hagiographical. Hey, um, I think that's a major contribution. And one of the creative aspects of Vincent, or revolutionary if you want to call it, to me he developed his own lexicon for the Daughters of Charity, his own set of vocabulary that applies to our way of life. We don't live in convents, we live in houses. Um, we don't have superiors, we have sister servants. The annual vows and they're, they're private and simple and renewal, renewable. So we don't have a novitiate or new members are formed in a seminary, a place of religious formation. So I think the terminology also um, was um, a very creative way of accomplishing the mission. And keeping us out of the cloister. <laughs> well, ergo, yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Yes? Yes, un unquestionably being a revolutionary. I think uh, absolutely in one sense, he was not a revolutionary intentionally. <laughs> His intention was not to be a revolutionary. And uh, actually, I fear people who 
identify as prophets. I am a prophet. Prophet is a, the good prophets are that's the effect of your life rather than your intention. And the same way to be a revolutionary. But I think he was a revolutionary and uh, truly creative in effect, but not by intending it. So I think I would suggest that mm. distinction. Mm. Thank you. So, so he's still like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we like, we kind of like that. We like it. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I suppose well, it, instead of revolutionary distinguishing characteristics, I know it, he was the king of networking. I mean, really and truly. He had political finesse and, and was a phenomenal networker and knew how to find the gifts that one had to use to his advantage. He was good at exploiting things in the most positive um, sense of the word. But could you, do you have any other markers? And why I'm asking for this is we work so closely with students and they're looking for different. Why is this distinguished? Why is this different? How is this different than that other school down the street? How are we uh, unique? It's something they can hang on to. Um, got anything? <laughs> I think, yes, uh, but I cannot resume, you know, just in a few words, uh, it's, a, it's a huge work you do, uh, maybe work on, you know, on the, on the letters of Vincent, Louise, but I'm sure you do that, uh, and read them with the students, try first to understand the context, that's what I'm doing with the daughters uh, in the Vincent Jean Session in Paris. Uh, where I give a lecture on their history. So try first to understand the context before trying to use uh, these letters to do something for today. And then, uh, after that, try to see what you can do with that. Because otherwise you, you put your own uh, appreciations and feelings on Vincent and Louise. Uh, for example, Vincent was uh, very prudent with the, the, power, uh, the authority of the women. He, he didn't trust at all the women for the question of leadership. No, but there are some texts where you can interpret that in a different way and say that he was very modern, uh, bringing this new life for these uh, women. And so, you know, uh, that's complex. For example, um, in the first rules in 1655 of the Daughters' Charity, the members of the council must be elected. But Vincent didn't trust at all the, the first sisters, so he decided that Louise will be the, mother, the general mother until her death. And the first sisters elected one assistant, but he didn't like her, so he named another one. <laughs> Uh, and he asked Louise just before her death to choose the next one. You know, so he was not uh, at all democratic, uh, democratic, uh, democrat, uh, in the sense of we give today. Uh, uh, but in another way, you can also say the opposite. Um, my answer is not very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah? So that's what makes Vincent really extraordinary at you know, the next level because he was able to know what social settings will work and able to work around those, you know, and not show them they mean what, what his methods are, but able to do it mentally without and then effortlessly and well asleep. So. Thank you. That's a nice slide. Well, I'm a lay individual and I'm not as erudite as any of these people. <coughs> Mine is just a mundane question, but in that first picture you showed us, you showed us the aristocracy sort of beat, and then you saw the uh, daughters of charity, and you said something concerning dowries. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you had to have money in order to become a daughter of charity. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. No, Allah, this wasn't. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to give a dowry to enter the community. You were just asked to come with the clauses uh, necessary for your first habit. 
but uh, the families were encouraged to give a dowry. Uh, so I worked in the, uh, the <coughs> registers of the seminary and in front of the name of each woman you have the, uh, the dowry. But if you make a statistic with that, you observe that um, they gave less money than in other similar congregations. So many of them came for very poor classes, even if the recruitment was changing a little during the 18th century. But this was really a congregation for poor uh, girls. And if, hmm? yes? The, the, whatever they brought, in one sense, was a contribution towards their support. And many times they didn't stay also mm -hmm. until they were able to go out and participate in the ministries. Mm -hmm. The reason I ask that question is because being an observer of what's going on here on the campus, it seems to me that people are given an opportunity of an education, no matter what their background, no matter what their financial ability, no matter what their religious uh, uh, affiliation is. And it seems to me that is carrying on Vincent's work. Mm -hmm of educating mm. the poor. Mm. That's true. And, and mm. nobody, at, at least from my point of mm. view, nobody has big distinctions. Mm. Everybody's here to learn, mm. and that's what the faculty encourage. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yes? Well, yeah, I'd like to mention about this dowry thing. Uh, the, the wealthy were very, very suspicious of, of the uh, Daughters of Charity uh, because mm. um, uh, when when uh, a young woman went into cloister, there was a protection for the family. Mm. She was in there, and she was in there for life. She had perpetual vows. The daughters didn't. Mm. The daughters went in there, and they had one-year vows. Mm. And then if they left, they left. And so mm. the family are saying, you know, what about this group? You know, mm. they're, uh, they're, we were secure. There's a security we feel about mm. the cloister life and so forth for our Okay. Yes. And about, if I remember, about, I think, 20% of the daughters' charity left the company during their life, their religious life. And you can observe also at what time, was it at the beginning? Or, and some left after sometimes 10, 15, 20 years of vacation. And so I don't have any answers, but I think one of them could be, as this, uh, they remained lay people, so they can uh, inherited for their families. So I think that some of them left when they received this money from their family and they had skills to work outside of the community. Uh, for example, in hospitals, uh, as nurses, in schools, as teachers, or also as a uh, pharmacian. What the name? Pharmacists. Pharmacists. And um, there is an example of a doubt of charity who, um, who left the community but stood in the hospital where she was. <laughs> uh, as a pharmacist, and some people try, I think, to to encourage them in that way. So that's true. Yes. Now, as you've done your research now on the second volume, has that statistic, that twenty percent who who left during their their lives, has that remained fairly constant through the centuries? Or? Today, um, I didn't work on that question yet. So I cannot answer, uh, but maybe in one year or two, <laughs> I would give you the answer. <laughs> if you have 45,000 in, in 1965 and you have 20,000 today, that's something. That's something mm. about the, uh, yes. The decline. Many left after the council, I think, during the 60s, 70s. Uh, mm. And then entrants were fewer. Mm. Also. Mm. Yes? Yeah, and about this question, I was uh, intrigued about the early years that you are recharacterizing for us mm -hmm. and how there were other communities do it like Mar Marguerite Nazo mm. was almost like a symbol, mm. you know, collective mm. symbol. Were the early daughters in recruiting from these other groups, from these smaller groups? Mm. I mean, actively uh, mm. recruiting them to come with us. Mm as a way of increasing numbers. Yes, uh, but would you say that they came from these other groups? Yes, yeah. okay. Were they yes. recruited? Yes, yes. So, um, so where did, 
Mm. Our early daughters yes. come from, from the countryside, so, but yes. you know th that is a very passive image. But mm. were they more actively even recruited? Mm. Yes. From so other during the twenty-first years uh, yes. at the beginning, so the company was mostly in Paris and outside of Paris, and most of the first sisters came from this uh, countryside. And there was an active uh, political of recruitment. Vincent himself sometimes went in the countryside to look for all these sort of girls. And they were alone, or two or three, teaching in a small parish. So he suggested to join the, uh, the first company. The Vincentians also, in their missions around Paris, on the estate of the Gondi, tried to, uh, re uh, to find this, uh, these girls and invite them to come. So that was, yes, that was an active... But what you just said makes sense because we know that Vincent would go out. Mm. But the fact that there were these groups already there, mm. um, that was his objective. Mm. That was his... That mm. gave it more purpose. Mm. So this is the first way of recruitment. There is another one from the ladies of charities. Yeah. Many of them had an hostel in Paris and an estate outside with a big house or castle. So we, you can see that some of the scissors came from these uh, states also. Mm. What, what year are these panels from? Oh, this is a beautiful engraving. Um, uh, the end of the 18th century. And you can see uh, what the, front of the scissors were doing. Right, I, I, know, I noticed every mm. single one of them it says the Sisters of Charity, yeah. not the Daughters of Charity. It's Le Sur is, is yeah. the Sisters of Charity. That Bec the, yes. the, the Sisters of Charity call themselves. Because very often outside of the Daughters of Charity, they were called Sisters of Charity. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, and look how easy it was to adopt an orphan. You just have to, to choose one and <laughs> <laughs> you come back with one child. Who's accounting their numbers? I remember talking to the uh, Mother General, um, before the present Mother General, who was from Spain, and she told us in a group that when she was a novice in Madrid, there were 400 in the novitiate class. There were two novices in Madrid, but that's the enormous number that were going on, say, 1950s or something, 40s. Yes. Yeah. 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 How um, poignant and apropos that Professor Colin Jones gives such a um, an ardent commentary and critique of your book. He told me, this is some years ago, that the um, sister archivist, Le Rudebach, kind of literally kicked him out the door and also kicked <laughs> his students out the door. And so there have, there's been a cohort of scholars who've been trying to get at the history of the Daughters of Charity, so they were all waiting for you to come along. <laughs> and I was very happy to be the first one to enter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the archives. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Thank you. Yes. Matthew, we want to thank you so very much for your scholarship, your very um, congenial way of presenting and responding, but we really appreciate your invitation to consider fresh perspectives on the early history of the daughters. And we are happy to have the opportunity to consider an appreciation of the collective foundation. Many of us uh, also are involved in reviving a memory and developing a memory that's so necessary for the adjournamento. So you've given us um, insights into that. I would like to say that in France, as well as in the United States, the Sœur de la Charité and Fille de la Charité has been used interchangeably over the years. And it wasn't in the United, until in the United States in the early 1960s that definitively and intentionally we started calling ourselves Daughters of Charity because the American roots had started as Sisters of Charity. But historically, it's, it's, they're used interchangeably. But as we continue with the Collective Foundation today and forward, all of us, let's remember what Vincent told the early sisters. And that was the beginning of your company. 
as it was not then what it is now. There is reason to believe that it is still not now what it will be later on when God brings it to the state on which he, deci- he has decided. So Matthew, we thank you very much and a special word of thanks to Father Udovic and Scott Kelly of the Office of University Mission and Values for arranging this program and this series and to Brian Cicciarello for masterminding the technology so that it's ongoing and to our catering service for providing lunch. But most of all, to each of you for coming, listening, and involving yourself in learning more about the Vincentian story and the Daughters of Charity. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.